name is Erica Pinto, and I'm the lead narrative animator at Santa Monica Studio. Just a heads up, this is going to be an interactive session, so for those of you watching online, I recommend you get a partner or a group together to get the most out of this session. If you're really not feeling very social right now, you can feel free to write down your responses during our audience's activities, but I do hope that you guys will participate. Also, be forewarned, there are some light God of War spoilers during this talk. As I mentioned, I am a lead artist. God of War was actually my first project leading a team of animators. So how did I get there? Well, I got my start in the game industry, fresh out of school at the, UN the UCLA Animation Workshop, go Bruins! And I got an internship at Electronic Arts Los Angeles on the Medal of Honor franchise. Bobby Coddington, who is now animation director at Insomniac, was my mentor at the time. And he taught me a lot about how to become a good game animator, such as how to make a good run cycle, how to work with start and end poses and get them all to match up, all that fun stuff. But Bobby was also my first example of what it means to be a good lead, about staying positive under stressful conditions, about being very passionate about your art, but also being passionate about helping others succeed. With each successive project, I learned valuable lessons from all of my leads, what to do, sometimes what not to do. So when my last lead left to pursue a personal project, my managers came up to me and asked if I wanted to jump in and take the reins. I wasn't quite sure I was ready to be a lead, but I did want to help people, and I wanted to help our production run smoothly, so I said yes. I quickly learned that there's a big difference between watching what other leads do and actually doing the job yourself. A lot like learning to be a good artist, it takes a lot of practice to be a good lead. So what are we going to talk about in this session? Well, there are dozens of books, there's video series, there's workshops, there's entire organizations dedicated to becoming better leaders, and I have about oh, 45 minutes, give or take, to cram all of that information into your heads, so everybody get your pens and your pencils and your laptops out. Are you guys ready? Yes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But what I am hoping is that by talking about my leadership experience on God of War, you all can get a sense of some of those leadership muscles that you can start building and flexing, in addition to your artist muscles, which are probably already pretty swole. <clears throat> These will be concepts that you can and should dive deeper into to prepare yourself for a leadership role, if you're interested. Let's kick it off with a little bit of an icebreaker. What does a lead artist do? So I'm going to ask you guys to just shout out stuff. Oh man, I'm sorry, I have all sorts of crappy stuff in there. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna delete all that. That was for my practice run. <laughs> Feel free to redo all that stuff if you want to. But uh, go ahead and talk and I will try to put it in. Anybody have a suggestion? Cry. <laughs> I will uh, put that here. <laughs> what else? Go ahead and speak up. Not all at once. Inspire. That's a good one. I heard someone else? Hmm? Document. Yes, that's very good. Document. Delegation. That's good as well. Establish an art style. Uh, typos. All right. Have a vision, that's good. Nurture. Nurture, nice. Communicate, very important. I'll put that there. Hmm? Be a good listener, that's good. Critique. Remove obstacles, that's good. Challenge. Challenge. Hmm? Be candid, nice. Yes. Shield your team from stress from above. <laughs> Enable excellency, that's a good one. All right, any last minute ones? Problem solving, that's good. Where can I put that? Maybe over here? Show empathy. Coordinate with game design. 
promote alignment. That's a good one. Let's see where I can put that. All right. I'm going to cut it off. This is a pretty good list we've got going here. Let me go back to my presenter view. All right, so for myself, I tend to break down a lead artist's work into five main concepts here. Communication, which someone mentioned. Organization. Inspiration. Accountability. And creativity. I'm going to break down these concepts a bit further throughout this presentation, starting with communication. So for those of you who haven't played God of War, there is a giant snake in our game, and you have to learn to talk to it. And Kratos comes up with a very interesting method of communicating with this snake. So I thought that was a good example of figuring out how to get your department running smoothly, collaborating with your team, and communicating your needs to other departments. The first thing I learned as an artist was how to get out of the groove. As an artist, it's very easy to shut yourself in the studio, put your headphones on, keep your head down, and focus on a task. This is actually encouraged for artists because often they need to focus for hours at a time to get really in the groove and get things done. But as a lead, you have to be aware of what your team is doing around you. So it's time to get those headphones off and figure out if there's any fires happening. This may come at the expense of your own focus, but it does benefit the needs of others and helps you maintain a big picture of what's going on. You can better guide your team to do their work well, such as demonstrating a combat move for your animators. <laughs> the next thing I learned is that leads often need to get away from their desk and visit people. There are lots of benefits of being in a studio versus working remotely. Communication goes more smoothly when you can see people's facial expressions, when you can use gestures to demonstrate what you want. You can have one-on-one -on -one conversations going back and forth with each other. And sometimes it's easier to demonstrate at someone's desk than trying to write up a detailed email with screenshots and all that stuff. So just get away from your desk. Now at Santa Monica Studio, this can be kind of difficult because half of our team is upstairs and half of our team is way downstairs. So often people don't want to make the trek because it's just so far. Why can't we just use Instant Messenger, right? But it really is worth it to make the trek you get more communication going, and you get a little bit of exercise, and who doesn't need more steps on their Fitbit, right? Now, if you need to talk to a lot of people, you could run up and down the stairs going individually to everybody's desk and hope that they're available and around, or you could just schedule a meeting with everybody and get them all together. The benefits of this are that everybody gets to prep for the subject that you're going to discuss and be in that mindset to discuss it. Plus, everybody hears the same thing at the same time, so there's less room for misinterpretation. On God of War, we tried to group our meetings to certain days of the week, such as Tuesdays and Thursdays. That way, on the other days of the week, people could stay in the groove and keep their work done. Now, we have a bunch of people gathered here, so I'm going to go ahead and start an audience activity. I'm going to uh, throw a couple instructions up on the board, so go ahead and wait until I'm done talking about all the bullet points until we start talking. It's a pretty easy one. Just Interview your neighbor. So turn to someone next to you and ask them their name. Ask them why they came to this panel. And ask them to talk about someone in their life who was a good leader. Take good, fental, could, take good mental or physical notes so you are really listening and remembering the responses. And feel free to exchange business cards or contact info if you so choose. That's part of communication as well. If you're going solo this time around, feel free to write some notes to yourself about point number three. All right, let's get started. So what have we learned about communication? It doesn't have to be scary. It's as simple as just turning to someone next to you and saying hi. And if you mess up or stumble a little bit, that's fine. Messing up is still better than saying nothing. I mean, we're not mind readers, and we won't know what you have to say unless you actually say it. So don't bottle it up inside you. Just keep talking to each other. One of the worst things that could happen to a team is that communication breaks down, and people just kind of go into their own corners and work on things without communicating to each other. So keep talking. The next concept I'd like to talk about is organization. This is one of the characters in our game. He's a shopkeeper, and he loves to keep all his tools nice and clean and his workshop nice and tidy. And as a lead, a little bit of OCD can go a long way as well to getting your team to run like a well-oiled machine. A big part of organization is time management, and a big part of time management is getting good estimates. Now, every artist is asked how long they need to get their art done. That wasn't a new concept for me, but the shell shock was figuring out how to gauge the speed of all my other team members. 
So you know, you would go to each of their team members and be like, well, how much time do you need for this task? But the problem is you don't want to pressure them to give you better numbers to try to get them to do their work done faster. What you're trying to do is get an accurate sense of how long the, the time is going to take them because that's going to help you plan out a proper schedule and figure out how to mitigate crunch if you, have, if you can avoid it if possible. Make sure to plan for unknowns and setbacks because you know stuff's going to go wrong or stuff's going to need to get changed. You're going to have to start over for some things. Um, I've heard about 20% buffer can be a good rough estimate just to tack on to every task. And remember that little stuff takes time too. A very small task that might be a half hour here, five minutes there, and half a day here. All that stuff can add up over a long production such as God of War, which took several years. So if you're not keeping track of that little stuff and, and planning for it in your unknowns and your buffers, then that can come up to bite you later. Be honest with yourself and with your producers. If you see that the scope of your work is getting big and too big for your team, start having those hard talks about cutting things or increasing your headcount. Definitely don't fudge the numbers because you're really only setting up your team for crunch or for outright failure. On God of War, we did a pretty good job of keeping track of our 100 plus cinematics. And we kept track of all their uh, progress in Shotgun. We broke down each of the production phases here and we were able to tag when things were, were being worked on. What we didn't do such a good job of was estimating how much time each of those tasks was going to take or how much time it actually took when it was finished. <laughs> yeah. Where we really failed was in keeping track of all those little things. We had a lot of small animations which we called points of interest or POIs which were not big full cinematics, it might have been just a small thing like Freya constructing a magical bridge right here. But add everything up together and it became way bigger and it just went way out of scope and we ended up having to cut all of these. You can see we just didn't do them and that was pretty sad. So we really are, want to collect data with those estimates. There's different kinds of tracking software you can use. We use Shotgun. Um, you can use Jira, you can use Handsoft, whatever option works best for your team. But the trick is just getting everybody to pitch in and give their estimates and give their actual time spent. Because real data is going to lead to better estimates down the line, and that's gonna help you with your scope planning. This can usually be like a producer's work, but as a lead, you can set a good example and send reminders to your team, put in your own estimates, just make sure everybody's doing it. And it doesn't have to be, you know, every five minutes or, or down to the minute. It can be kind of rough like in hours, but it really does help. As I mentioned, we weren't great on God of War about collecting that data. So after the project was over, we went into Perforce and we started looking at our Perforce history, just seeing when the dates were, when a file was checked in, seeing the notes of what people did when they did a certain scene. And we kind of took a sample set and tried to take our best educated guess based on the revision history notes for how long it might have taken to do this. It wasn't super accurate, but it was still a better baseline than doing nothing. And now we have some rough estimates for planning out our next project. Beware of burnout. You know, it's one thing when you're only responsible for yourself and your own personal well-being and your health, but it's another thing when you have a team relying on you to establish a reasonable schedule and scope. So really keep an eye on the health and morale of your team. We had a pair of talented animators who kept staying up till one in the morning in the office, despite me telling them to go home. Well, whose fault was it? Were they just perfectionists, staying late, noodling on everything with all their passion? Or was it maybe that because they were so fast, I piled on too many tasks on them? Maybe if I'd had a better sense of the scope, we could have talked about cutting down their work a bit, or maybe hiring more people so that they could go home at a reasonable hour. The next thing in order to organization that helped me was just keeping tidy. And this was something I never thought about when I was in film school, learning how to use spreadsheets. Woo. But when you're a lead, learning some office software can really help you with asset lists, estimates, order forms, all that fun stuff. So take some time to learn something like Excel or Google Sheets or whatever's gonna work best for you. A bonus is as an artist, you can make them look pretty. That's fun. Documentation, super important. Take time to write down your team's best practices, your workflows, your tutorials, etc. 
This will, one, make it easier for new hires to hit the ground running and also serve as a handy reference during crunch. When we were in the midst of production, the animators had something they called the buttery smooth checklist. Because we didn't have any cuts in God of War, we had to make sure that every animation traveled smoothly from gameplay into a cinematic and back out. And everything on this checklist, I mean, you don't have to read it, but it actually helped the animators before they exported anything to make sure that when they exported it and put it in the game engine, there was the least amount of pops and troubleshooting we had to do. This was very crucial to the success of our no-cut camera. All right, let's try a little organizational audience activity. I'm gonna ask you guys to do a little flow chart, a quick and dirty three-step workflow of your position. Where does your work come from? If there are any students, your work might come from a teacher or something like that. What work do you do? And who do you send your work to? For example, as an animator, I get my work from the writers, they give me the scripts, I talk with the level designers to figure out where my cinematic's going to take place. I work with my director of photography to figure out the staging of the scene. And then we shoot it, and then the animator takes it and assembles it all together and animates it and makes it look awesome. We then export that and send that to our implementation team. We send that to our lighting team, effects, and audio. I mean, this is a pretty generalized workflow, but you guys get the idea. So go ahead and make your own flow chart and then share it with your new best friend and colleague sitting next to you. Some final takeaways about organization. Really, everything that you're doing is helping you get the big picture by understanding your flow, your place within the production process, and also learning just how much time each of those steps take so you can run smoothly. On the cinematic team, we've charted out, like I mentioned, that was a, a general workflow, and this is really our, our full pipeline here. And it's really, it looks scary, but what it's doing is it's helping us identify our handoffs between all the different departments. It's identifying any potential pain points and figuring out areas where we can work simultaneously across disciplines to save time, such as right here. So that's being really, that's, that's really beneficial for us. I'd like to take a quick moment just to talk about outsourcing since this is becoming more and more common in AAA game studios. And it was definitely a skill that I had to learn on the fly as a first time lead. First up, get to know your vendors. Every studio is different. Some like to take your work and really run with it and get creative. Others prefer very specific direction from you so they can get their work done to your specific um, advice. Some are good at working out a variety of tasks and others are more specialized little boutiques that are really good at doing one thing in particular. Some like to present their own schedules to you and some prefer to work with you to establish timelines. So just get to know your vendors. Learn uh, how to give very specific and detailed feedback because it can be harder to communicate across time zones and across different languages. So really use images, videos, Skype calls if possible. Here's an example of one of our outsourcing notes where we listed a very specific um, time frame and a note and drew on top of a still frame so people got a good idea of what we wanted from them. <clears throat> Also, time management becomes even more crucial when working with outsourcing, because when you're dealing with your internal team, you sit next to them, you see them every day, it's cool, you're communicating, but with your outsourced team, it can be easy to lose track of them. You might forget to send your timeline, your feedback in a timely manner. You might forget to check in and see if they're blocked by anything, if they have any roadblocks and they're stuck on work, and they might not have communicated with you. So don't leave them hanging. Make sure you keep track of them. What helped us was having an outsourced coordinator because he really kept those lines of communication open, would give me reminders, would help make sure that our assets were sent out and come back in a nice, smooth manner. So he helped us a lot. All right, moving on to inspiration. This is all about keeping your team members motivated and growing. Probably not the way that Kratos does it. What you should do is be a source of positivity. Because let's face it, stuff's gonna happen that there's gonna be decisions made that your team doesn't like, that you may not like. So you may have to scrap some work. You may have to start over. There's gonna be tasks that nobody likes to do. There's gonna be things that make you just wanna rage out. But what happens is that your team members are watching you and they're gonna gauge how you're feeling. So if they see that you're frustrated or worried or complaining, then they're gonna see that as permission to act out as well. So be a source of positivity. I know this is very cliche, I've actually already heard this a few times at this conference, but fake it till you make it. You know, it, it might seem disingenuous to put on a happy face when you're actually upset, 
But this really does go a long way to boosting your team's morale if they see that you're keeping pushing forward even under stress. It also can actually help prevent your own negativity from spiraling into something larger than it needs to be. Now, if you're really feeling upset, you just don't feel like you can hide it under a happy face, then find an outlet to let off your steam. You know, talk to your producers or managers or just find a friend that you feel like you can talk to them about and just let it out or find an activity to do. I like to sing in a choir. When I was at UCLA, our choir director's motto was, leave your baggage at the door. You might have had a worse day in the world, but when you come to rehearsal, you leave that at the doorway and you come in and you put on a smile and you sing. Now, I mean, part of singing is that you're, you're performers, you're acting, you know, so it might seem a little fake, but by the end of rehearsal, we actually were all genuinely feeling better and we would leave with a genuine smile on our face. So having that outlet is very important. Ah, feedback. You could do a whole talk just on feedback. In fact, people have and are doing that. It, it falls under inspiration because giving good feedback can really help keep your team motivated. Something that's, that's good for, for feedback is just getting to the point because you are an expert in your field and you are responsible for the end result being shipped to the rest of the world. So don't lose your feedback amongst too much fluff. Now as an animator, we love to use our bodies to demonstrate feedback, as you remember from the beginning of my slides. It's very direct and to the point. We even have a box full of prop weapons near our desks for um, very important research. Yes. Now, getting to the point means being honest, but not putting people down. Because again, your team is looking for someone they can turn to for help. And if they feel that you're just gonna yell at them or whatever when they come to you, then they're not going to come to you. And then how can you help them? So don't be belittling. Be encouraging. <laughs> when, when you're in art school, you, you know, you get graded on your work, and if you do really well, you get an A, and that feels awesome. And, and in the studio setting, it can be harder to come across that kind of positive reinforcement. So make sure you call out the good stuff, especially for your young people who are just out of school and maybe struggling to adapt to the work environment. On God of War, we had an intern who, during reviews, would end up getting a lot more notes just because he needed more experience. But I always made sure to point out what he did well and gave him lots of encouragement. And he ended up taking on some of the most ambitious scenes on our project and just did an amazing job. So that was awesome. Finally, follow up. Some artists can be introverted. I mean, that's why they're artists. They want to express themselves through their art and not talk about it. So just stop by their desk, make sure they're going in the right direction and let them know that you're there for them. Let them know that they can ask questions, they can give their own opinions, and you will be a good listener and listen to them. And don't forget to request feedback, too. Especially as a first-time lead, you probably have very little idea how effective you're being. It can feel kind of awkward asking for advice, but it's important to get your team to be honest with you. You can show them that you care about them enough to want to be better. You can also talk to your producers or managers and see how you're doing from them. This is really about inspiring yourself to keep growing. Now this is a little scene from God of War, probably the only time in the game where Kratos asked for advice. I'm gonna go ahead and play that video for you. I mean, I get angry at you sometimes, but- Do you? I mean, sometimes, yeah, a little. When are you angry? What? With me, when? Oh, I guess sometimes when you don't think I can do something? But I can. So you see, Kratos asked his son for advice. Like, when do you get angry with me? Why, why am I making you angry, you know? And if he hadn't asked, then he wouldn't have known how his son is trying so hard to prove himself to his father, to show that he is grown up enough and he can handle some more responsibility. So that was a really cool moment that I thought was cool. So remember that artists come in all different tasks, kinds, you know, we've, this is our animation team, pretty diverse. And understanding what they love to do lets you let them work on what they're passionate about. So give them what they want to work on. But also remember to push them out of their comfort zone because that's really going to help them grow. Okay, I'm not going to make you guys do an activity right now. This is more of a take-home test called Inspire Your Team. I'm going to give you kind of a, a role-playing scenario where you have a team of artists and your job is to keep them happy and figure out ways to challenge them and keep them growing. Your first team member is a scrappy new kid, fresh out of school, ready to soak up information like a sponge, and needs more experience. 
Then you've got your seasoned veteran, those game people who've been in the trenches for over a decade, they know all the ropes, maybe they're a little bit jaded, you know, but they, they want to do the work, they're in, it, they're in it to win it. You've got that super fast insomniac who comes fresh from another AAA studio, is really fast cranking out assets, but ends up working themselves to the bone and refuse to go home even at one in the morning. How do you keep these people happy? How do you challenge them? How about someone who comes from film or television? They're super good, their stuff is such high quality and they give great feedback to everybody, but maybe they've got some extra difficulty working with the game engine. Your final team member is an indie jack of all trades. Maybe they came from commercials, maybe they came from indie games, they know a little bit about everything, they love wearing lots of different hats, they love to branch out and experiment, but maybe they lack a little bit of polish and focus. This is your team, so do a little bit of role playing and think about how you might help them keep them happy and help them grow. I'll leave this up here for just a second in case you want to write it down. All right. Inspiration is really about learning to speak each of your teammates' language. Everybody thinks differently. So if you can figure out how your team members think, you can help them stay motivated and happy. You can tailor your feedback and help them stay motivated. On God of War, we had a series of meaty scenes, cinematics featuring stunts and big creatures, all that cool stuff that animators love to get their hands into. My task was spreading them out amongst my team. So I would go to each of them and ask them what they wanted to work on, while also keeping in mind their experience levels, their speed, what they're passionate about, and made sure that in the end, everybody got at least one big meaty scene. That helped keep them happy, and it also helped keep my schedule happy because I wasn't piling all the big scenes onto one animator. All right, accountability. This is about taking ownership of your impact on your team and on your team's impact on the game. Because the decisions that you make affect other people. They affect your teammates, they affect other departments, especially your downstream departments. So make sure you always keep them in the loop. That's getting back to communication again. Here I'm speaking to our dialogue coordinator, Leilani. Audio is actually a very important downstream department for cinematics, so we need to make sure they always had what they needed from us. Most often it was just play blasts of our cinematics with the time frames or the time code on it so they could properly sync up the sound. But keep your downstream departments in the loop. Set the bar for quality. You've trained your whole career to know what looks good. So make sure you can set expectations for what you want from your team. Because when your team understands what's high quality, what you want from them, that helps them function more autonomously. That helps them take ownership of their own stuff. And that helps your team run more smoothly, even if you have to step away, like I did. <sighs> I went on maternity leave right before Alpha, which is probably the worst time in the world to have a baby while you're trying to wrap up your game development. But what I did was I met with all my producers and my senior animators and discussed how I was going to hand off all my stuff. I wrote up some detailed current state documents for all of my unfinished work to help transition all of those scenes off to other owners. And I was able to step back in after a few months and see that work had progressed pretty well while I was gone. In fact, later on in production when one of my contractors had to leave midway, he ended up doing the same thing for me. He gave me a, a detailed current state document for each of his unfinished scenes so that I could make a smooth transition handing it off to other owners. So that was a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. Ah, yeah, accountability. Nobody's perfect, but don't sweat it, you know. But do talk to people, own up if you mess up. And work to fix the problem. Your team members will respect your honesty and your commitment to grow with them. But don't dwell on it. I mean, most times people, everyone else will have moved on before you. So don't let it eat you up inside. Really just let it out. Like when you make a crappy drawing, just toss it out and, and move on to the next one so you can get to the good stuff. Part of accountability is also making sure that your voice is heard and your team's voice is heard since you represent them. Now we know, artists are usually the cool kids in the back of the room doodling on their notebooks. But as a lead, you don't want to sit in the back. So take a seat at the table. Don't let other people make decisions that affect you and your team without your opinion being heard. So be visible. Come prepared to those meetings. 
Be aware of the subject matter. Make notes. Bring questions. Be an active participant. This has the benefit of making those meetings more engaging, and then you don't get bored and start watching the clock and start doodling your sketchbooks or whatever. Go to bat for your team. Remember, your team members are counting on you to represent them. So make sure that you get what you need for your team to work well from others. And give back to the other departments as well. This is a little bit more of an introspective exercise you can do on your own time, sort of a personal accountability checkup. First off, pledge to speak up at meetings. Like actually take out your calendar, find out when your next meeting is, and write down that pledge. Like really write it out. I pledge to speak up at this tech art meeting and maybe take some notes like what am I going to say at it, what questions am I going to ask. Like make a pledge. If you haven't synced up with your downstream departments in a while, set a date to sync with them. Ask them what you can do to help make their jobs easier. Finally, write down a name or two of people that you maybe need to own up to, some you want to talk to one-on-one. -on -one. Figure out when you can schedule it. It could just be like a casual walk around the parking lot or a coffee break or something, but you know, be open, take some time. Remember that when you are accountable to others, they will be accountable to you, that old golden rule. Finally, and perhaps most importantly as artists, creativity. This is all about finding that delicate balance between all that leadership stuff we've been talking about throughout this whole session and finding time to do what you've trained for your whole life as an artist. Of course, don't try to do everything yourself. It's tempting to think of lead artists being able to solve all the biggest problems, doing all the biggest art tasks, taking everything on yourself. Just don't. You're gonna be overwhelmed with the sheer amount of work to be done and you'll have no time to achieve that high quality bar that you want to set. You might get so bogged down in leadership stuff that you have no time to work on art at all. Or you, conversely, you might be focusing so hard on doing really good art that you're letting your team down and not being a good lead. So get some help. Let your producers or managers or other leads help you out and give you advice. Remember to trust your team to take ownership so that everyone else gets a chance to shine as well. Art school is really about honing your skills and becoming a master of your craft, while leadership is about helping others unlock their potential. That being said, do take some time for yourself, because you are still an artist. So tell your producers this is an important priority for you and schedule accordingly. Find a few juicy tidbits to keep. For me, this actually works best during pre-production, where I have a little more time before I'm wrangling a very large team. I get to jump in the mocap suit, I get to do a little pre-production -pre stuff, start assembling scenes. It's a lot of fun for me. If it helps, you can schedule some me time in your calendar, actual blocks of time that you put in Outlook or whatever so you can focus on your work. That way you don't get booked for meetings and you can actually get in the groove for a little while. That way I was able to animate Freya's turtle friend there and a few other things. Take some time to geek out on all that new stuff. Follow cool artists on Twitter and Instagram. Read up on the latest tech and trends. Share it all with your teammates. Our industry is changing and moving forward every day, and you don't want to get left behind. Geeking out on the new stuff might also spark your own ideas to move forward. So it's about inspiration and creativity. So let's geek out a little bit. Share something awesome with your partner that you've seen or want to see at GDC, or anywhere that you've seen it. Also, thank your partners for being awesome, too. Go ahead. All right. Let's, let's wrap it up. What does a lead artist do? Communicate, organize, inspire, be accountable, and create. I mean, I'm not going to go through all these bullet points again. This is basically my entire presentation. This is just a slide for people to take a picture of or whatever in case they haven't been taking notes throughout the production. <clears throat> I'll leave it up a little bit. But let's think back upon that initial exercise we did. Ah, you might notice that they fall into those five categories. So I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> ah, it's like I did it on purpose. <laughs> A little bit of last minute advice. 
ask yourself, do you want to be a lead? Leadership is not for everybody. It's not a very glamorous job. It's more like a service job. You are working for other people. It's not about seeking the limelight. It's about, again, helping other people achieve their potential. So take some time to discern which growth path you want to follow in your career. You might find that you prefer to be a specialist rather than a lead. But if leadership is something you actually feel very passionate about, then just remember that your first time can be kind of overwhelming. But that's normal. It's OK. What can you do about it? Find a mentor. Think about that person in your life who you felt was a really good leader and talk to them. Or find other leads or, or you know, people in your industry you can talk to. Remember that failures and successes are both powerful lessons. So keep practicing. You can even practice leadership before you become a lead. In fact, many leads get their roles because they were already showing leadership qualities before they were asked. Finally, remember that every lead is different. And that's not a bad thing, because every team is different, and the needs of your team are going to be dependent on what you guys are doing at any specific time. So what are your personal strengths, and how can you be the best leader? Thank you very much. We have some time for Q&A. If you're interested, you can come up to one of the microphones there. Please state your name for the record. Oh, yes. hi, I'm Andrew. Hi. Thank you so much, Erica. That was an awesome presentation. I actually had a question for you. Okay. Potentially a bit of a tough one. You mentioned a little bit, right? At some point, like you're, you're for example, you're not going to know if like an artist is at the studio at 1 a.m. because they just really want to make this one thing cool or because you messed up at some point. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of tough because the way you mess up as a lead impacts people in very non-trivial ways. And especially sort of going through that first, first time experience, maybe you have some advice for people on like, how do you deal with letting people down sometime? Uh, <laughs> how do you deal with letting people down sometimes, especially as a first time lead? I think the important thing is being honest, just letting them know, look, I, this is my first time, I could use your support and, and help. You know, and again, being observant and just letting yourself see what's going on around you. I mean, if you don't catch it in time and you do let someone down, make sure you follow up with them. Make sure you follow up with, with your producers or whatever and let them know what happened and just make sure, you know, you, you can take notes or what, whatever and, and document what happened so that next time it comes around, you're better prepared to handle the situation. Just being honest. Fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> Over here. Oh, hey. Hi. Oh, that was loud. What's your um, name? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, how do you deal with giving feedback to specialists that might be more skilled than you in a very specific field, and uh. you know that the asset is not uh, living up to the quality standards that you want, but yeah, trying to give feedback to them. Hmm. That, that is a tough one, because again, the lead is not necessarily the best artist in the room, but it is someone who has the bigger picture and the context of what's going on in the project. So what you can do with your specialist is just say, you know, what, what we need from you right now is going to help serve the project as a whole and all of our team together and when we're in it focusing on, on the game itself and not necessarily on this one asset. So just keeping a bigger picture and working with them. And, and also just keeping in mind that yes, that they may be more skilled than you and you respect their quality and their talent and their, their effort and their time that they've put in. Thank you. Hello, my name Hi. is Danny. Hi, Danny. Hi. Um, my question is about how do you balance between keeping people happy and giving them harsh feedback? Mm. <laughs> how do you balance between keeping your team happy and giving them some harsh feedback? Because sometimes people don't want to hear about it. Yeah, that's feedback. true. <laughs> and I think that comes back to the, the inspiration topic about knowing your teammates mm -hmm. and knowing what, what affects them the best. You, you may find yourself speaking to different people in different ways because everybody reacts differently. So if you need to give someone harsh feedback and you know they might take it personally, just, just make sure you, you acknowledge that. Like, look, this isn't anything personal. This isn't about you. Uh, this is really about focusing on the game and how we can make the game better. And you know, if, if, you're, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. We can agree to disagree. But at this point, um, we need to get the game shipped. And I, I feel like we want to have a unified vision going forward. Thank you. That OK. <laughs> 
Hi, so I'm a little bit confused about like what is the difference between becoming a lead artist and an art director? Ah, um, that really depends on the studio you're at. At Santa Monica Studio, the lead artists are more responsible for kind of the day-to-day -day processes of keep working with the team and, and checking in with them, make sure they have everything they need to work. Our art director is kind of one step above the leads and they communicate with the leads and make sure that they're meeting one-on-one -on -one with the creative director and the other directors in the studio and really getting that super big vision. And then they communicate that down to the leads who then communicate that down to the artists. So it's really kind of a, a waterfall effect of, so that the creative director doesn't have to go to each person individually. They can talk to the directors and then they can spread that information out to the leads. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Oh, hi. That's fun. <laughs> I'm Miriam. How do you manage a super small team? Let's say you have only two to three artists in the room and it's a very small independent uh, game studio mm -hmm. that may be currently be uh, having some issues with ego. So how do you manage that? Oh man, ego. That's, <laughs> that's the elephant in the room. I think... Especially with smaller teams, sometimes it can be difficult having kind of a, a leadership thing versus you know everybody being on equal ground. And, and currently, my team is pretty small because we're we're in a stage of production where we're not ready for a full team. So I think it's it is more about speaking to everybody on their own level and and showing respect to each other. I think. The, again, you're, you're trying to keep the focus on the game and not your individual needs and wants and fig figuring out what is going to help this game come together. And, I mean, just being honest with each other and, and you know, sometimes it, it takes getting out of the studio sometimes and just having some chats outside of work just to get everybody feeling more comfortable talking to each other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Hi. Hi. So... As a lead, mm -hmm. I know often you have to make really, really tough choices. Um, one that you probably either way is really harsh. And um, what is the toughest choice you ever had to make as a lead? And as of now, like, do you think you made the right choices? Mm -hmm. Something that's like quickly, oh, I have to make this choice, right? You know. <laughs> what is the toughest choice I've ever had to make as a lead? Mm -hmm. Oh, gee. I think for me personally, it's been about hiring and figuring out who the right people are for your team, because those are the people you're going to be working with for a long time, so making sure you make those right decisions. And, and that, that's, you don't always know just from an interview what you're going to get, but you try to you know, gauge as best as you can and if you can give them a test. You know, um, and gosh, in terms of production, probably the hardest choice is, in, is when we have to let things go or tell someone that they have to start over because it didn't work. And you know, no one likes to have their work thrown out, but you try to just sit down with them and then tell them again, it's nothing personal, um, and just let them say this is for the good of the game. Do you feel at that point, like, do you feel like maybe you failed to get direction in the beginning or that's usually how just reiteration works? Um, I, I think just, yeah, uh, knowing that it is part of the iterative process and letting everybody know that, yes, this is, you know, it's not like art school where you do a project and you get a grade and you're done. It is about iterating and, and making sure that, you know, it is to the highest quality we can before we ship. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello, my name is Shannon. Hi, Shannon. I was wondering, what are some ways that you evaluate your own success as a leader and manager? How do I evaluate my own success? Man, I think for me, the best part, well, at the end of each project, we do a post-mortem. So I, that's when I tell them, hey, guys, write down everything that went well and everything that did not went, go well, and let's talk about it and figure it out. And, you know, I try to get them to stay honest and give me that feedback. And, and what really helped me, like, feel good was at the end, some of my contractors, as they were leaving, they said, hey, you were a really good lead. I don't know. Sometimes it's as simple as that, just someone coming up and saying, hey, you did a good job. So I think that's important to also say to other people is telling them that they did a good job too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Uh, hi, thank you for the good talk. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm Miguel. Hi. And my question is like, uh, when there are like too many ideas on the table, like how, more or less how do you coordinate so that like the, like the amount of information overload um, actually like does not bog down the, the production of the project? For example, there's like many ideas of how things should move or something. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you like kind of like just like condense everything into just getting to one solution? Or... 
let me see if I understand. You're, you're wondering mm -hmm. when there's too many ideas on the table, how do you mm -hmm. make sure that you can move forward in a right pace and mm -hmm. everything? I think when you're in a meeting, just setting goals for yourself, like this is a one hour meeting, let's throw everything on the table, but by the end of the hour, we should narrow it down to what we really need going forward. Um, or if it's something where everybody's emailing each other back and forth, and no, you should do it like this, and no, you should do it like that. I mean, that's where, as a lead, you have the authority to step in and say, okay, we're gonna nail this down. Um, maybe I'll talk about it with the other leads and I'll get back to you guys. You know, it doesn't have to end right here. We, we can, um, we'll make the decision and let you guys know. I mean, sometimes you can pull rank like that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, so let's say you have a, a person under you, um, and I mean, of course, game is about reiteration, right? So how if you're given the task to somebody below you, and then after several reiteration and critique, um, the work is still really off the mark, and ah. the, you know the time is running out. So what do you do? That is a tough one. How, what do you do when someone's reiterated time and time again, and it just isn't quite hitting the quality bar? I think. First of all, you, you have to acknowledge the work that they have put in so far. So make sure you, you let them know, I appreciate all the work you've put in. I feel like at this point, we should talk about other directions we can go. And maybe you're just very tired and let's see if we can put you on another task and maybe get those creative juices flowing again. Um, maybe we'll pass this off to someone, just have them quickly wrap it up and get you working on something new that, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're tired of doing it six times. You know, let's give you something new to challenge yourself. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are we good? No, one more. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Two small questions. Mm -hmm. uh, first one, uh, what the amount of artists you consider healthy in your team to keep the balance you talked about? Mm -hmm. Like to be a manager and to keep, you know, looking new stuff in the industry. Oh man, what, what do you consider like a good team size to, yeah. to lead? So for example, five artists is okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think five is pretty good. You know, I was just at a talk where they were talking about a study that was done about ideal team size and I think the study said 4.6 people. <laughs> um, uh, at the peak of production, I had seven animators under me and it, it was a little tough. I, I think five would have been nice, but I think I was able to get to seven. It really is about how you manage your time and if you feel like you can handle handle um, scheduling enough time to get to each person individually, then I think you're doing a good job. But it's really about seeing like how underwater you feel um, for the amount of, of team that you have. Depends on the project as well. Okay, thanks. And the second one, uh, what if you have a, ba a batch of work not interesting, mm -hmm. like uh, fixing bugs, for example, yeah. from outsourcers, and uh, you have a great team of different uh, specialists, uh, skilled, offshore. Uh, so uh, how, would you, uh, how would you motivate them? The question was, uh, what do you do when you get tasks that is not very interesting and you yeah. have a bunch of specialists that you, you, know, you want right. to make sure that they're happy? For me, if, it, if it's a big task, rather than trying to take someone down for a long time, I might say, okay, everybody, we're gonna do this bug fixing, everybody take five bugs and let's just get it out of the way as quickly as we can. You know, that whole many hands make light work thing, because then everybody's in it together, everybody can kind of complain to each other and then say, oh, I gotta do bugs, but then everybody gets done at the same time and then we can move on to the, the next fun thing. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. There's no further questions. I'd just like to do a quick plug. We have a couple of uh, cinematic related talks coming up this week. First on Wednesday, Dori Arazi is giving a talk called Creating a Deeper Emotional Connection, the Cinematography of God of War. And that's gonna be a really deep dive into the staging and composition and cinematography for our cutscenes. And on Thursday, I'm giving a talk called Keyframes and Cardboard Props, the Cinematic Process Behind God of War. And that'll be of just kind of an overview of everything from script all the way to screen, everything that we went through to make sure that our cinematics worked with no cuts. Thank you again very much. We are hiring. 